Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Ray Edwards, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. The campaigns he's written have resulted in an estimated $100 million in sales. Not all that money has was his to keep. Uh, Ray has served high-profile clients, including New York Times bestselling authors Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen, who are creators of Chicken Soup for the Soul, and lots of other niche businesses like gyms, weight loss clinics, many more. So all this stuff applies to you if you're listening. He's also the author of the Amazon bestseller, Writing Riches. Ray, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for asking me. It's uh, my honor and privilege to be here with you. When I reach out to people like, who are the legends of copyright I should uh, interview and your name came up over and over so I had to reach out and I want to hear your big lessons you know the successes the the mistakes what worked what didn't work and you have you listed four big lessons and so I wanted to hear those before we get into some of your best techniques and quick wins and how you tell stories what are some, four big lessons well the first big lesson is to take responsibility for your own life and your own business. We tend to want to blame the economy or we want to blame our boss or some other external force for what happens to us. And when I was uh, just getting started out, I was in the radio business long before I was a copywriter. And there was a, a guy named Dan O'Day. He's still around. He's a teacher in the radio business. He teaches people how to be personalities on, on the air. And I, I listened to your interview with him, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, man, you are the most thoroughly prepared guy I think I've ever met. <laughs> well, thank um, you. I went to a, a seminar where he was talking, and he was uh, selling, actually, tickets to a seminar that he did teaching radio personalities how to be better DJs. And one of the objections that came up from the audience was, well, my company won't pay for me to come to this seminar. And his response was, well, whose career is it? Is it your company's career or is it your career? And that was a, a, a light bulb moment for me. And I realized, you know, if I don't take responsibility for me, it won't happen. Uh, my second big lesson was kind of tied to that, and it was to invest in myself. That was the first program that I invested in. I used my MasterCard, my entire $300 limit at the time on my MasterCard to get that program. And then um, Later, as I was making the transition out of radio into the world of copywriting, I invested $5,000 to join a mastermind group because I wanted access to the people who led the group. So I invested money. But I had to also invest time and show up for the meetings and travel. And I had to invest time and show up for the calls, the Q&A calls. And I, it was interesting because they had this, uh, this open call time where – certain hours each week you could call in and speak to the two guys who led the group for 10 minutes. And I would call at the appointed time and I would always be the first one on and they would say, well, nobody else has called in so you get another 10 minutes. So I'd get 20 or 30 and I was amazed that people didn't invest, you know, they, invest, they invested money but they didn't invest the effort to actually make that connection. Well, because of the connection I made with those guys, uh, one of them was named uh, Armin Moore and the other was Alex Mondosian. And Alex recommended me to uh, people like Jack Canfield, which led to me writing for the Chicken Soup for the Soul guys, him and Mark Richter Hansen, and ultimately Tony Robbins and some of the other uh, big, fancy, impressive names that uh, I've had the, the privilege of writing and, and working on their marketing for. So that was my second big lesson was invest in yourself. And it's not just about money. The third I want to ask about that one, actually, Ray. So how did you decide? Because there's a lot of mastermind groups out there. What made you choose that one? How did you do it? What was your thought process behind it? Um, I'd like to tell you that it was very carefully and strategically thought out. But what happened was I wrote the copy for an event. It's, this is kind of a chain of things that happened that led to this me joining this group. I wrote the copy for an event that happened in Atlanta. And I got so excited about writing that copy. I'd never been to one of these kind of um, start your own business sort of seminars. You sold yourself, right? You sold were... myself. <laughs> yes. And I, 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 I bought the upgrade. You could pay $100 extra and have um, the privilege of eating a meal with the speakers. And they had this room set up where they had like 10 or 12 different tables and the different speakers sitting at the different tables. And Armand Morin at that time was probably one of the most well-known guys in the online marketing world. And he was sitting at a table by himself. 
And I thought, well, I paid a hundred bucks, so I'm going to go sit next to that guy. <laughs> and uh, I did, and he was very. Uh, other people came and joined us, but he was very communicative and very talkative, very friendly. Uh, he, we're great friends now. He's a super guy. And uh, but he he turned to me at one point and he says, you know, I have a seminar. And I said, yes, I know. And I didn't really know at the time. I was just I wanted to be polite. And he said, are you coming? And I said, yes, absolutely. So at that night, I go back up to my hotel room, and I get on my computer, and I, I look up his seminar, and I, I realize, oh, my gosh, it's a $2,000 ticket to go to this seminar. But I told him I'm going, so I bought the ticket. I go to that seminar, and he offered at that seminar this mastermind group. And I just felt such a connection with him, and I felt like, well, this guy knows what he's doing. He's got, at that point, there was like 400 people or 500 people showing up for those seminars. He got all these people to show up and pay $2,000 each. He must know what he's doing, so I'm going to join his group because I want to get to know that guy. That's how I ended up joining that group. Wow. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Big lesson number three. The best way to rationally serve your own self-interest. This was a big turning point for me because I was a big fan of Ayn Rand. I still am. Uh, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, and she's a proponent of rational self-interest. But I learned that the, the best way to rationally serve your own self-interest is by serving others. Uh, and that was, a, that was a corner that I turned that had amazing ramifications for me. There's a story in the Bible, people know about the book of Job, and they usually use it as a, a way to excuse their suffering. Well, I'm just I'm having the sufferings of Job. Well, if that's what you get out of the book of Job, you miss the whole point. And most people haven't even read it. They just kind of know the story vaguely. They don't really understand what happened. But there's a point in the book of Job where Job is healed of all of his afflictions. And the point when that happens is when he prays for the healing of his friends. He prays for them first, and then he's healed. And uh, I, I take that to heart. I um, A couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Oh, really? Which, uh, yeah. Uh, which was uh, kind of a big event in my life. It was like, well, I didn't see that coming. And uh, it's a, for those who don't know, it's a progressive neurological disorder. The general medical consensus is it only gets worse, and you don't, you don't get better. You just get worse. Uh, Michael J. Fox right. has Parkinson's disease. Uh, Muhammad Ali has Parkinson's disease. Um, and so. That was a, a point where I, I went through a brief period of introspection where I felt really kind of shut down by that. And I, uh, I became consumed with my own victimhood. Right. And the moment that I stepped through that and began to sow into other people's lives and serve other people, like before that... The irony is I had been involved in a ministry where we prayed for people's divine healing. And we saw people get healed from cancer and heart disease and deafness and glaucoma and arthritis. I mean, miraculous, spontaneous healings. And I, of course, went and immediately got prayed for, and nothing happened. Now, I don't actually believe that's true now. I think something always happens. It's a matter of timing. God's delays are not God's denials. But I had to work through all of that, and the transformational moment for me came when I realized the way to serve my self-interest here, to get my joy back, my vitality, my health, is to keep serving other people. Big lesson. Uh, big lesson number four. Hold on. Is, so tell me, talk about that for a second. So serving other people. So what do you do then? Okay. So God has the greatest sense of humor of anybody. Um. Everywhere I go, every time I speak at a conference, every it seems like every airplane I get on now, I run into somebody who has Parkinson's disease. And the first few times it happened, I was like, really, God, this? what are you doing here? Because this is not funny. It may be funny to you, but it's not funny to me. But I realized that, um, in fact, okay, one day I'm walking on my daily walk for exercise, one of the things I do to help preserve my health and improve it. Um, I'm walking along the street about a mile and a half from where I'm sitting right now from my home, and I hear a voice say, please help me, sir. And I look, and in the ditch is an old man. 
and he's just lying face down in the in the dirt in the ditch. And I go over and I help him get up, and he's he's shaking like crazy. And I said, "Are you okay? What happened?" And he said, "I." I have Parkinson's disease, and I fell, and people have been walking by, and they couldn't even hear me. I'm oh so God. glad that you stopped. And I brushed him off, and I, I just felt the Lord saying to me, after I walked him back to the place where he lived, and I prayed for him, and I felt the Lord saying to me, just because you have a problem doesn't mean that I don't intend for you to help other people up out of the ditch, literally, and brush them off wow. and put them in a place of safety and serve them. And so over and over again, I've run into people who have this same affliction that I never knew anybody who had it before, and now I, I can't escape it. I, I was on a plane yesterday, and there was a gentleman on the plane who had Parkinson's disease. And uh, so it's not just that. I, uh, I, I went back to work in the, the business of it's not a business, in the ministry of uh, praying for people and ministering to people's needs. And I got, I, I, for a while, I stopped speaking publicly because I felt like, oh, people are going to you know, see me tremble or something. And yeah. Like, that's important. It's been just such a journey of discovery for me. Yeah. Um, and learning that, you know, I still, here's, here's what it's like. It's like God handed me an alarm clock, and he wound it up, and he said, this is going to go off, and you don't know when. Because I don't know whether this will get a lot worse or whether it will get a lot worse quickly or it'll never get a lot worse or I'll be completely instantly. I don't know. And I don't, but by the way, I just want to be clear I don't think God gave me Parkinson's disease. I think um, some people think that trials come into their lives, you know, to teach them to be better people. Uh, we do learn from trials, but I have a fairly simple theological formula for figuring out where things come from. God is good, and good things come from God. And the other guy is bad, and okay. bad things come from him. And it doesn't matter how bad this guy makes things, God can take whatever happens and turn it into a blessing for us, if we allow it, if we take that perspective. Yeah. So that's how I, I see serving other people as being in our own rational self-interest. And you don't have to have a disease or some dramatic thing that's happened to you, because I have news for you. You do have a terminal condition. It's called life. Right. That's a powerful story, Ray. I appreciate you sharing it. And what I have found with reading your blog posts is, I was going to save this question for later because I'm really interested in, you really are vulnerable with yourself and you talk about a lot of personal things and that can't be easy to do, but I think it's something people can relate to. How, do you, how did you get past that in the beginning to be vulnerable and to talk personal without kind of, I think people are afraid, are afraid of what people are going to think or, you know. Well, sure. Um, and I was. I think uh, that's like a power of some of your copy or stories or whatever you want to call it, is you just kind of, you're very personal. The, for me, it was um, a, a real conviction that God wanted that from me. That uh, I reached a point where I, I gave over everything to him. I said, this, you know, my life is yours. My business is yours. Uh, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, if you want me to go and be a pastor in a church for six people in the hills of eastern Kentucky, where nobody will ever hear my name again, except those six people, and they can all be 85 years old, I'll do that, if that's what you want me to do. Uh, and the, I know we were probably going to talk about this later, but it just seems like the right Go time. ahead, yeah. I um, a couple of years ago, uh, I felt that my wife and I needed to go to ministry school. So we put the business on hold. We went uh, part time with the business, and I just said to God, "You know, I'm going to have to trust you for the income because now I have to stop doing all the things that generate the income in order to make the, go to school." It's a big leap, yeah. It was a it was a huge leap. We had our most profitable year in our business ever. Wow. And I I don't. I don't encourage anybody to think of that as a formula. God is not a vending machine. Like, you know, you put it, oh, I'll, I'll do what Ray did, and God will make me have my most profitable year ever. Probably won't work that way. You've got to work out your own uh, 
as Paulo Coelho calls it, your own personal legend. You've got to figure out what that is. Um, but uh, I thought I would shut the business down and become a pastor as a result of that. And I really understood from God during the process of going through that year that that's not what he wanted from me, that he wanted me to continue in, in the place, in the marketplace where I was with where people are, to go out into the world and, and be light and love people and show people what love is really like and what, what God is like. And, um, and so that, um, that process led me to the point where he said, so if, I, if, if you really are giving me everything, then you've got to stop hiding me in the closet. So I tell people... Because that, that could be controversial too, right? I mean, sure. talking about religion in general, you could either put someone off or you can draw them in. I was in a mastermind group at the time with some pretty high-level marketing people, and I told them what I was going to do, and they said, you cannot do that. That's crazy. Do not do that. Whatever you do, go ahead and you know, do your, go to ministry school and your pastor thing or whatever it is you want to do, but do not do what you're talking about. And so two decisions got made because of that feedback that I got from them. Number one, I was absolutely certain that I was going to do it. And number two, I left the mastermind group. Um, I love those people. It's nothing against them. So if any of them are watching this right now going, oh, I didn't realize that. Was <laughs> I love you. It's okay. It's your uh, fault. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you helped me on my path. Uh, so um, for me, there was no choice. And when I wrote that post, what I call my, you know, I tell people that was my coming out post. And I always get funny looks. Like, well, read it. You'll understand. Um, when I wrote that post, I thought, well, this, this might you know, God says keep the business, but this might make the business a lot harder to sustain. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, the reverse happened. Uh, there were apparently people waiting for that kind of message from somebody. And that's why I encourage everybody, just be who you are, because first of all, everybody else is already taken. And secondly, you are who you are for a reason. It's not an accident. So how did you, Ray... When you went to the ministry school, how did your business thrive and do as good as it's ever done? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I got, mean, you must have put like, you know, um, you're a smart guy. Were there certain systems that were in place that you knew you had to put in before you kind of stepped away? Or what did you do? Because, I mean, anyone would uh, who wants to step away, whether it's just a weekend vacation, sometimes people can't even do that. And without their business kind of dropping, you know? Mostly I tied up a lot of loose ends. Um, I shut down a lot of projects. I stopped doing a lot of what I was doing. Uh, and all I really had available to me was uh, the blog and posting to the blog and communicating with my audience in that way. And I just, the phone rang and people would say, I have a project I heard from your other client that you we're good at this. Would you be willing to work on this for us? And that's what happened. I, I, I would love to tell you that I had a brilliant plan that anybody could duplicate. They could take my blueprint for going to 10 hours a week and having their most profitable year ever. But that's not how it happened. Yeah. I thought you were going to have some, because I have read one of your blog posts. I know you've mentioned Sam Carpenter and he's big on systems. And I know you've... And, that, and, and, and hey, I'm, I'm a big proponent of all that. And you can read about that on my blog. And you know, better yet, get his book, Work the System. Um, and you can get it for free at WorkTheSystem.com. It's a download PDF if you want to check it out. But um, those things are all valid, and I encourage people to do that. And I encourage people to uh, – there's another book called uh, 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall, which I highly recommend for this same purpose. So, you know, yes, eliminate the 80% of stuff that you're doing that is not yielding results because – 80% of the results that we get, the money that we make, the sales that we make, the success that we have, comes from 20% of our activities, which means, to me, I look at that and I say, that means out of a 10-hour day, eight of those hours were wasted. Right. I could have gotten the same result in two hours. So definitely do that. But during that ministry school time, I didn't really have that insight. It was yeah. really just a leap of faith and God's providence. Yeah. And Ray, I wanted to get to the question about one thing the audience can do to get a quick win to get results right now. But before I ask it, 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 I'm curious about what's been a post or a podcast that's made you the most uncomfortable to write or put out there? Oh, it was the Parkinson's post. 
Uh, it was definitely because I, I struggled with when to do that uh, because, number one, I thought, well, when I post this, people are going to look at me differently. They're never going to look at me the same again. It's always going to be an evaluated process. Like uh, watching this interview right now, someone is looking at me going, I can't tell if he has it. And, you know, and they're evaluating that. And when I go, I went to a, a mastermind meeting in Nashville you know, just yesterday. I got back. And, you know, people, I could see it. They, they were like, they look at me carefully and they say, how are you doing? I, I knew that was going to happen. So, number two, I thought, well, some people are going to write me off. They're going to say, well, he's got this disease now, so forget about him. I'm going to move on to somebody who, who's not a ticking time bomb waiting to go off. Um, and, and let me underscore something for those who don't know. Parkinson's is not fatal, so I don't – life is. It, it all, we all die. Right. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, you don't you don't die from Parkinson's. You die with it. Um, so I, sometimes I get you know people are like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. How long do you have? It's not all easy, right? Like I don't know. How long do you have? <laughs> How um, does it affect you now? I mean, is there any part of it that manifests? Oh yes, it yeah, does. I, I have uh, I have tremor and I have some uh, some random movement and uh, stiffness and I can't type anymore. I couldn't type very good to start with, so that wasn't really a huge loss. Um, uh, dictation is how I do mo almost all my writing these days. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I definitely am affected by it, but not. It's very mild, you know. A lot of people tell me, "Well, I can't even tell." Uh, and some of my more honest friends will say, "Yeah, I can tell, but it's not very." You know, they're not trying to be nice; they're just trying to be real. They're like, yeah, I can sort of see what's going on with you, but it's not really that big a deal. So I was worried about being written off. And then I was also worried about, I didn't want people to, uh, to think I was trying to play on sympathies or, you know, call attention to me. That, this was a real struggle for me about when to do it. And I yeah. did a lot of praying and thinking about it. And when I finally got to a point where I felt like, okay, I, I know where I stand on this. I had to settle all the issues that I had. Right. Like, am I angry at God because he hasn't healed me? Or that he let this happen to me? Or am I discouraged by this to a point that I can't go forward? I had to work through all that stuff myself before I was able and ready to share it with anybody else. Yeah, and um, so that was definitely the scariest. Yeah. I ask that because I know sometimes the most important, powerful thing that we do makes us the most uncomfortable. And, and guess what? That has been the most important and powerful thing that I've done. Yeah. So now to the the audience, what's one quick win to get they can get results right now? What's something you did in your business that really made a difference? Okay. So this will sound vague, but well, let me just tell you the story of how I did this first. Um, there was a lot of people who were hanging out their shingle on the internet as copywriters, and they had they'd written big, long sales letters about how fabulous they were. And I had written one of those two, and mine was pretty good. But I figured, you know, this is not where most people are starting. And I, I had read over and over again this rule of copywriting that said, You've got to join the conversation that's already taking place in the mind of the reader. In other words, you've got to put yourself in their shoes. Uh, like Atticus Finch says in To Kill a Mockingbird, you can never really understand a man unless you've walked a mile in his shoes. To Kill a Mockingbird, one of my two favorite novels of all time. Read it often. Um, and so I thought, well, what is it people want? Well, they want to sell more of their stuff. So I started offering, instead of writing a big long sales letter, I just went where people were posting in online forums about their, um, their, their website not making a lot of sales, and I would go and take a look at their website, and I would write up a short critique and just post it. I met people where they were. I talked to them about what they were thinking about and talking about already, and I said, hey, I looked at your website, and here's five things you could do right now that would improve it. You know, Write a better headline, tell a story here in this part of your copy. It's very specific. And then I would say, if you want a full critique, just send me an email and let me know. I'll do it for free. Very and kind I, of you. I wrote up a free critique, and I told them exactly what to do to fix their copy. And then at the end of it, I was, again, I was following the conversation that I knew was taking place in their mind. Because what most of them were thinking was, well, this is great, but I do not want to do this. This looks like a lot. I was going to ask, how many people actually followed through with your advice? So I said... If you want somebody to do this for you, I'll do it. Here's what I would charge. Here's an invoice, and here's how to pay me. 
And for every 10 of those I sent out, I got three back with money through my PayPal account. That's good. So it's it's a matter of find the fastest path. This is this is so counterintuitive to people. They want to have big fancy advertising copy or you know write a brilliant headline. No. Find the fastest path to helping people. That's what they don't they don't want your course or your software or your thing, whatever it is that you're selling. Mm-hmm. They want help. They want their whatever's bugging them or hurting them, they want it to stop. Yeah. That's that's the quick win. Yeah. It goes back to big lesson number three. All of them probably fit under one of your big four lessons. Yes. Um, so I know you were in radio to start off. What made you transition to copywriting? How'd you get into copywriting? Um, I started studying copywriting when I was in radio as a way to preserve my job, really, because I, I figured out that disc jockeys were pretty disposable, uh, depending on what the ratings were like or the budgets were like. Salespeople stuck around longer and drove nicer cars. And so I figured if I could help them help their clients, if I could write better ads for the clients, that would give me job security. And, and it happened because, you know, people, disc jockeys would get fired and they'd be like, well, you can't can't fire Ray because the Ford guy loves him because he writes those ads. Um, and then I started using direct response copy to market our stations to listeners so we get better ratings. And then along about around about 2000, 2001, I realized the, hey, the radio business is in huge trouble because there's these things called MP3 players and satellite radio and streaming and broadcast.com and nobody in our industry was taking it seriously and I, I figured out I need an exit plan. Mm-hmm. And I discovered that people would pay a lot of money if you would write copy for them. And in radio, anybody who knows anything about radio understands, you don't get paid to write copy in radio. This is how much you get paid to write copy in radio. Zero. And so my first copywriting, paid copywriting gig was $400. And I was, I was overjoyed. I was like, really? This person who I have never met got my critique. I just told you about that technique. She's a, she was a doctor in the UK. She got my critique. She got my invoice. She sent me $400. I wrote some copy, and she's happy. This has possibilities. So that's how I got started. So, Ray, tell me some of the most successful campaigns and why were they so effective? Um, There's been a lot that have done really well, but two that sprang to mind when I saw this question were uh, there was one for a a guy named Jack Bosch, and he had um, written, um, or, or, well, he hadn't even written it. He was creating a course teaching people how to invest in real estate in a in kind of a weird way because unlike everybody else um, Jack recommended going and buying uh, tax sale tax lien properties that were going to be foreclosed on other people have taught that but his his technique was to do it for very small amounts of money and always do it for cash and never borrow money to do it and you did lots of these little transactions and that and you kind of snowballed your way up to bigger money and he was unique because he was an immigrant. He came here from Germany and he didn't speak the language and he showed up with just a few bucks in his pocket and a suitcase. And he had this tremendous success story. And he contacted me and said, I, I, want, I want you to write my copyright. And um, I told him how much it would cost and I thought that would be the end of it because I was charging $30,000 at that time. And he's like, okay, no problem. And um, he was the most, to this day, the most methodical client I've ever worked with. Every date that he put on the calendar for a promotion happened like with machine-like precision, Hmm. which I believe is because he's German, German engineering. He's like a BMW guy. Um, And uh, he he was just like clockwork. And so when we launched this product, it was 2008, September. The very day our launch started was the day the banks collapsed. Wow. Because of bad real estate loans. And Jack called me. He was in a panic. He's like, we have to stop the launch because nobody wants to hear about real estate. And I said, no, everybody's thinking about it right now. And they're thinking about debt and how the banks have collapsed. And your whole system is on not going to the opposite. Yeah. So we sent out an email with the subject line. See, I told you. Boom. $1.7 $1.7 million in a week. Wow. So that, that one, I, I really love that story. Um, and then another uh, success story was a, it was a progressive story. A client who is now a friend of mine uh, named Dr. Andrew Jones 
uh, was a veterinary doctor, still is, in Canada. And he wanted to sell ebooks online telling people how to treat their dogs and cats at home with homeopathic remedies. And when I first heard that, I was like, that's kind of crazy, first of all. It's weird, second of all. And third, aren't you putting yourself out of business? And he told me, well, that's what I want to do. I, I don't like having a clinic and staff and all this expense. And so I wrote the copy, and he started making money. And he, and he called me one day, and he said, so we're making like $1,500 a month selling this ebook. What's next? Now what do we do? And I said, well, you build a, a how-to course. And just have somebody follow you around with a video camera through your clinic and show people how to do the stuff that you taught in the book. So he did. And uh, he said, he called me and he said, well, we've shot all the videos. Now what do I do? I'm like, well, now you sell them and you charge like $300 for them. And everybody else that he was learning from at that time, because he, he bought courses and, and advice from different people, they told him, nobody will pay $300 for that. Well, they were wrong because uh, he, he got uh, Jeff Walker's product launch formula. And, and I told him, I said, this is what you do. You go get this guy's product and you just follow the instructions. So he did it. And he did a launch, and he made forty-five thousand dollars in his first week. Wow! And set up a seven thousand dollar, seven or eight thousand dollar a month income stream out of that. And he, and we've worked together progressively over the years since that time to build this business. He sold his practice. He travels the world. He just got back from Europe not long ago. He snowboards and skis. And in fact, he's coming into town next week, and we're going to talk about doing some other project together. Uh, and I just love that. I look at that guy's life, and I think, you know, not, it, it's not that I'm like some wizard. It's just that I got the privilege of connecting him to the right resources and ideas at the right time and serving him. And by virtue of doing that, I, I benefited as well. So, What were some of the components in the copy that really helped? Because obviously, you know, you put out not great copy and you're not going to be selling $45,000 worth of stuff. Well, it was him telling his story of his own dog mm -hmm. uh, that he loved that died of cancer uh, and that died – horribly because of the medicines that he gave to the dog, which is what he'd been taught to do. Right. And he's like, I don't want this to ever happen to anybody else's pet. There's got to be a better way. And so, you know, other veterinary doctors in, in his area hated what he was saying because he was saying, don't do this to your animals. You know, there's natural ways to treat them uh, that will not only make them healthier and save their life, but won't put them through these horrible side effects and and so when we told that story in the copy, uh, people connected. You know, it's one thing to say, if you give your the dog the medicines that your veterinary doctor is recommending and you give them all the, all the chemicals and so forth, mm -hmm. they're going to suffer and they're not going to be healthy. It's yeah. another thing to say, my dog that I loved uh, dearly, that was a companion for life, got cancer and suffered and I saw him struggle to breathe as his lungs filled up with fluid and... And eventually we had to, I had to administer the drug that took his life to put him out of his suffering. And I cried. Mm -hmm. You tell that story. And, right. and, I mean, look, both of us right now are like, whoa, I don't want to have to go through something like that. And that's just the power of story. Yeah. It's why stories are you know, the greatest teachers in history taught by telling stories. Yeah. Jesus taught primarily by telling stories. And, you know, you kind of, guided him through that and brought him to that, but not everyone listens, right? What's advice that you give to clients where they maybe don't listen? What are some big mistakes that people are making right now? Uh, not telling their true story. Uh, I had um, I had a client come to me. He had a, uh, I have to be careful because I don't want to unveil yeah. somebody. I don't, I don't edit these at all. So, <laughs> okay, right. so yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. Um, I had a client come to me and he, he, um, he had a product that he wanted to sell, and he was, through talking with him, and I do lots of background research on people before I write for them, like you did for this interview, by the way. Tremendous research that you did. Thank you. You found out things about me I, I, I'd forgotten that I knew. I was like, wow, really? I like when uh, people tell me that, yeah. <laughs> um, this, so this guy, I found out through our conversations that he was a, a Marine. He had retired from the Marine Corps. And so I wrote this copy around the strength and the honor and the power and the struggles of becoming a Marine and what that meant and what that meant for his company and going forward. And when he saw the copy, he totally freaked out and said, oh, I don't want, I don't want to tell that story. I don't want to use that. That makes me uncomfortable. I want something more generic. And I'm like, that's not powerful. 
And he said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to tell this. And he put his foot down. So we took it out of the copy and it didn't do well. Uh, that's a big mistake, not telling your true story. Um, the second is focusing on features instead of benefits. So I had a, another client who had produced this big uh, course on how to make information products, how to take your expertise and turn it into a product. And what he wanted was I had begun writing this copy that told the story of how turning your, your knowledge into information that can benefit other people can give you freedom. I was telling this story of you breaking free. What he wanted to focus on was the thud factor is what he called it. How big is the thud that this thing makes when it lands on your front doorstep from UPS? It's got thud factor, Ray. I want you to talk about I've got 18 CDs and there's 72 hours worth of audio and there's 37 hours worth of video and there's 575 pages and there's 29 chapters. Well, those are all features and nobody cares. Nobody wants your 18 CDs or your 537 pages. They want freedom. Right. They want joy. They want connection and love and self-confidence. And so that's a, a huge mistake. People focus on features instead of the ultimate benefits. And then um, the third, this probably is the biggest mistake, actually. should have been number one. Thinking that you are your audience. And I hear this all the time from clients. Well, I'm, I'm, I am my audience. I am the market. I know exactly what they want. No, you are not. And no, you don't. By the virtue of the fact that you have a market or an audience, you are weird. <laughs> Most people don't have that. And the fact that you have a, a thought in your head that I have something that I'm going to offer to this group and they're going to buy it is weird. So you're out. You're out of the equation when it comes to knowing what they want. You've got I never to thought somebody. of it like that. That's interesting. You've got to have somebody go yeah. and study those people. If, if you do it yourself, it's, it's hard. You've got to study them and, and know their language and understand what magazines they read, what TV shows they watch, what neighborhoods they live in. What does their life smell like? When they get up in the morning, what does their house smell like? What do they see the first thing in the morning when they wake up? What do they think about all day long? What are their fears, their frustrations, their anxieties? And the only way to do that is to get into life with them and, and know that stuff and then tell that story from their perspective. Nancy Duarte, who is the, the creation genius. She's amazing, yeah. Yeah, she, she created, for those who don't know, she created Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth presentation. Yes. Uh, I interviewed, the, I had the pleasure of interviewing her as well, yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow, okay, now, now you're my hero. <laughs> she talks about how, you know, you're not the hero of the story. We think that we're Luke Skywalker, but we're not. We're Yoda. The audience, your prospect, is Luke Skywalker. And you've got to remember that they're the hero of the story. Yeah, yeah. I often, we have to keep remembering that. What, you know, Ray, you've had a lot of successful campaigns. What's one that didn't do well? And uh, why do you think? Um, okay, so I had this uh, client who came to me, very famous guy. And he wanted me to write copy for this product that he was offering. And I was very excited to work for him. I admired him. I, I got a copy of the product, which I was thrilled about. I went through it with a fine-tooth comb. I took hundreds of notes. I wrote some copy that I was proud of, and he ripped it to shreds. We got on the phone, and he just second-guessed every line. and that, that I could take that. I have a thick skin. But then it became, um, I would do a revision, and he would want to revise my revision, and he, it, the copy became such a Frankenstein mess, and I didn't have the, at that time, I didn't understand that I needed to be the powerful person that I am, the same powerful person that you are and that everybody is, and, and know what you know and say to this guy, look, you need to take the copy that I gave you and run it the way I gave it to you instead of screwing with it because this is not going to work. And guess what? It didn't. It, it fell flat. Right. And um, I, it was just a horrible mess, and I felt so bad about it. I was a, I had to deal with this guy to get a percentage of the sales. He paid me a big check up front. It was going to give me a percentage of sales going forward. And I called him one day, and I said, look, I feel bad about how this turned out, and this is what I should have told you. Run my copy the way I wrote it. And I didn't. But I don't want there to be any bad blood between us. So I said, "Don't you don't owe me anything else. Just don't ever tell anybody that I wrote that copy. <laughs> because I didn't. Right. And 
we're friends to this day. And, and but that was a that was a big mess. And the, the lesson I learned was um, know what you know and own that and be true to that. Because I had this gnawing feeling in the pit of my stomach the whole time saying this is not right. Listen, and your I, intuition. I didn't listen. I should have listened. So Ray, what are your some of your favorite headlines? Um, I wrote a headline for a campaign um, that came from a movie title, and it was called "There Will Be Blood." And it was uh, there was a, one of my clients had uh, had some of his own students rip off his course. They took his course, kind of rewrote it, but very thinly. Oh wow! Anybody could look at it and see that. Oh, you took product X and you just made it called it product Y and kind of rewrote it a little bit and said it was your own. Yeah. And uh, so my, my client and friend called me and said, I don't know what to do. And I said, I know what to do. Let's, um, what if you gave it away for free and you kind of issued your sales letter as a throwdown. You, you threw down the gauntlet. You said, I'm giving it away for free and I got a brand new thing that I'm going to teach people how to do. And you copycat guys now figure out what to do with that. So this was the headline for that campaign, There Will Be Blood. And I just wrote this emotional, I mean, this, uh, this sales copy that I wrote did $3 million in less than a month. Wow. And uh, it was written in 45 minutes in a coffee shop in Sedona, Arizona. Amazing. There's so much more I want to dig into, but I know we have limited time. So I'm gonna, um, I want to know how you craft a story. What are some things people can do? Because I know you, you know the power of stories. Um. You know, I think through the journey that, that people are, that the story goes through, I, I love the, the, the Joseph Campbell hero's journey. I won't go into all that because we don't have a lot of time. Look it up if you don't know it already. Um, so I, 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 beyond that, follow, looking for that storyline, which I think is there in every story that we tell, um, it, it's the story. <laughs> um, read Paulo Coelho's uh, The Alchemist. I, I just, just saw that you, you finished that. I, I read it once before, but I just read it again. And I just, up until now, my favorite novel of all time was Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. But now it's been displaced by The Alchemist. Um, so anyway, beyond that, just technique stuff. Uh, I use short words, short sentences, short paragraphs, lots of dialogue uh, when, I can, when I'm allowed to do that. Sometimes clients are like, I don't want this. It's like a, a, a book or a story or something. And, I, and my feeling is, yes, exactly. But not everybody gets that. And then um, lots of uh, cliffhangers, if you will. Section to section, little bits of curiosity, little loops that you leave open that you, you pull people through the story and then you tie off one loop, but you open up another one. And you move them progressively through the story to keep their interest. So, Ray, I have... Two more questions in two minutes. Okay. One is, who are some of your mentors? And who do you want to meet that you haven't met yet? Um, so mentors. Um, first, there's the dead guys. Um, Claude Hopkins, David Ogilvy, John Caples, uh, Eugene Schwartz, the great copywriting mentors. And I'm focusing just on copywriting because that's mostly what we're talking about. Um, Gary Halbert whom I had the pleasure of meeting once briefly, and I wish I'd been able to spend more time with him because what a genius uh, writer he was. Uh, living living mentors uh, from afar. I don't know uh, Gary Bensavenga. We've, we've exchanged a couple of emails, but he is, in my opinion, the greatest living copywriter on planet Earth um, currently. I could be wrong, but maybe I just don't know who the other guy is. Um, John Carlton is a, a, a mentor that I know a little. We... Again, we've met a few times and exchanged a few emails, but I went to a seminar one time with $5,000 in my pocket just to buy all of his products. Wow. And learn from him. And my current uh, close, like, personal mentors are uh, Michael Hyatt, Dan Miller, Ken Davis. Um, Dave Ramsey is a mentor of mine. I, I know him a little. I've met him once, but I don't really know him very well, so I can't claim a personal relationship. And who do I want to meet? Yes. Uh, we have one minute. I want to know who you want to meet, and I want you to tell people where they can find you, too. Okay. So business-wise, I would love to meet Warren Buffett, Richard Branson, and Bill Gates. Uh, I, every one of those guys scares me. 
I would be intimidated to meet them. But that's one of the reasons why I would want to meet them. On a personal level, I'd love to meet Rick Warren, um, Billy Graham. And I admit it, I'm a Star Trek geek. I would love to meet William Shatner. Um, and then, uh, what was the other question? Where can people find you, find out more information, your wealth of knowledge that we can only boil down in this short period of time? RayEdwards.com is really the one place to find me. And I would really encourage you to listen to my podcast. You can subscribe to it. It's free. It's a one-hour show. I've done it every week for 119 weeks running, and I plan to keep doing it as long as I'm breathing. Yeah. Ray, I appreciate it. I know you have to go. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. God bless. Thanks, Ray.